Hi, this is Nico Peruzzi with Outsource Research Consulting, and today I'm going to give you a, a recent history of choice-based conjoint. This presentation will be a quick hit of the most important issues. Give me about 10 minutes and you'll learn a lot about CBC. So before listening to this presentation, you should have a basic understanding of what conjoint is, where it's used. For some background, you can visit my website, check out my blog, and the resources section uh, for some basic information about conjoint. I'm going to focus only on choice-based conjoint methods today, as these are by far the most commonly used and are seen as the most natural way for respondents to express product preference. So note that the term discrete choice can also be used for the category of choice research I'm going to discuss. I'm going to avoid stats as much as possible and keep things practical. Where I do discuss stats, I'll try and give you some highlights. Marketers started using choice-based conjoint in the 1980s, gained popularity in the 90s. And here's a typical choice-based conjoint card from what I'm calling choice-based conjoint CBC 1.0. So typically a respondent might see a dozen or more cards like this. Now early on the idea was introduced to give respondents a none choice to help researchers get a better gauge of actual preference levels. So let's call this CBC version 1.1. Now more recently, the concept of a dual response none was introduced. So the idea was that when we had a none choice up with the product choices, it was good for the respondent, but we were losing valuable data when they didn't choose one of the three product choices. So by placing the none choice after the product choices, you can see that we asked them after the choices here whether they really would buy the product that they specified. By placing it after, we can capture the full data about preferences and for attributes and levels making up the product, and we also capture the none parameter. So let's call this version 1.3, and by many people it's considered the best method for basic choice-based conjoint. Okay, we've got to stop for a moment and talk some stats. Today some basic choice-based conjoint data is still being analyzed using aggregate logit, so you should understand some basics about it. So I'll summarize aggregate logit this way. It was an early algorithm used to analyze choice-based conjoint data, and now there are better methods. So logit has this problem that it aggregates all respondents together and ignores potentially useful individual respondent differences. For example, if you had two brands of smartphones, Apple and Motorola, and half the sample likes Apple and doesn't like Motorola, and the other half likes Motorola and hates Apple, aggregate logit will tell you that brand is not important. It only models the average respondent. Now, Logit has an assumption called IIA, independence from irrelevant um, alternatives. And having an assumption means that stats work best when this rule, this assumption, is met. I won't get into it too deeply, but suffice to say that this assumption is frequently violated when using aggregate Logit for choice-based conjoint. The classic case is called the red bus, blue bus problem. And when a model assumption is violated, that's a problem. It reduces the accuracy of the model. Now there's some modeling tricks uh, to get around this issue, but it's a lot more work than simply using a better algorithm. Now hierarchical Bayes, which we'll call HB, is the new standard for analyzing choice-based conjoint data. New is relative as it's been pretty mainstream for the past 10 years. Bottom line with HB is that it produces utilities that better match holdout tasks. In other words, the model is more accurate and it preserves respondent heterogeneity. So it produces individual level modeling. And you can do great things like carry forward your conjoint results into a segmentation analysis. And because of the individual level modeling, you can gain more useful information than you could with aggregate logit based CBC when you're using smaller sample sizes. Now note that your normal issues of sample size related to generalizing to your population still apply. So aggregate logit has been on its way out for at least 10 years. So be careful of using 1990s technology now that we're in the 2010s. Now, if you thought HB was a great advancement, hold on for what's even newer and better in the area of CBC. Let's call this CBC version 2.0 because it really is different. I'm talking about adaptive choice-based conjoint, ACBC. Now, in a moment, I'll show you some screenshots, but let me preface things by summarizing some of the benefits of ACBC. Now, the adaptive CBC task has a variety of sections that help better engage the respondent, and the interview adapts to the respondent's choices to make the interview more relevant to their choices. Now, research on the research shows that model accuracy is even better with CBC using HB. Price can be represented in a more flexible, realistic way that makes prices better match the product profiles they're paired with. And the interview picks up on what's called non-compensatory decision making. This is when respondents set minimum or maximum acceptable values, cutoffs, standards, thresholds for certain attributes. The respondents specify that they must have something or something else is unacceptable. And the result is a more relevant set of choice tasks unique to the individual respondent. ACBC is analyzed using HB and we know that's a good thing. So I want to quickly show you a CBC screenshot again uh, so you can remember what the format looks like. 
Remember the respondent will see a dozen or more screens like this one over and over and this is called the choice exercise. Now note one criticism of CBC that I want you to keep in mind before we uh, go on is because of the want to gather as much information as possible on all the attributes and levels, lots of combinations of attributes and prices are shown. And sometimes a fully loaded product is shown with a low price and or a stripped down product is shown with a high price. Now we can use what are called prohibitions to moderate this issue, however the issue still often occurs. So an example here is that we've got a 30 frame per second video camera and it's at $99. Here in this case we have no video camera, although it does, ha does have a large hard drive and both keyboards, is at $399. There may be occasions in a traditional CBC where choices, product choices come up that just seem impossible. So let's talk about ACBC. It starts with an exercise called the Build Your Own, and this is where the respondent chooses from all the levels of all the attributes to build their ideal product or service. Now optionally, we can use what's called summed pricing, and here the respondent sees incremental price increases as they choose levels of each attribute. So notice the base price at the bottom here, we're starting at $99, and as someone would want Apple brand, or if they want a larger amount of storage, or a better video camera, each of those is going to add an incremental price. Those would be added into the cost for the feature, and the total at the bottom would sum up and increase as they go through the exercise. Next respondent goes through a series of screeners. And they're shown a number of products that are roughly near the product they built in the Build Your Own section, although the attributes and levels are stretched a bit. And the respondent tells us if the product is a possibility or not. So um, the idea here is to pick up on non-compensatory decision-making behavior and also to establish the none parameter. So as the respondent goes through, and if they do show some of these cutoff rules that they're setting, there's two types of uh, questions that can come up. This screen asks whether a particular feature is a must-have. If someone keeps going to product profiles that have these things, we may say, is, is one of these really something that you must have in this product? The opposite of that is asking whether a particular feature is unacceptable to the respondent. So these screens only appear if that response pattern emerges. And now by answering all the must-have and unacceptable questions, the coming screens of the interview adapt and will show or not show features that the respondent insists they must have or that they don't want. So what emerges is a better choice exercise, one that's customized to each respondent's needs. We gather all the data from the build your own, the screeners, and the must-haves and unacceptables to create a more relevant choice tournament for the respondent. We don't need an none option because we've captured the none parameter during the screening task. And we don't have to show as many screens because we've captured a lot of data in other parts of the exercise. So notice how Apple is the only brand shown here. So this respondent must have said that that's a must have for me. In traditional CBC, we'd be showing random brands, even though the respondent is clear as to which brand they want. Also remember the issue I discussed above in CBC, how a loaded product can be mismatched with a low price and vice versa. So with ABC, ACBC using summed pricing, the price shown in the choice tournament matches the product profile it's paired with. Now there's some finer points of summed pricing that I don't have time to get into in this presentation, but note that price modeling with ACBC is very flexible and accurate. So when should you use ACBC versus CBC? Well, with very simple uh, designs with only three or four attributes, these can be simply solved with regular CBC. Just use HB for your analysis. Now, CBC is great for pricing research, but ACBC gives even more flexibility. Now, if there's a downside to ACBC, it's that the interview is slightly longer than a traditional CBC exercise, given the same number of attributes. It may take seven to 10 minutes to do an average ACBC exercise, so you shouldn't drop it into an already long survey. Now, quick note, in my experience, ACBC projects are only perhaps 5 to 10 percent more expensive to conduct than traditional CBC projects using HB. And note that slightly smaller sample sizes are possible with ACBC versus CBC, and that can help save on budget. So this has been a lot of information in a very short amount of time, but let me summarize by saying that choice-based conjoint has come a long way. When you talk to somebody about conducting a conjoint project, it's helpful to be aware of where CBC has been and where it is currently. And here's some questions that you could ask. Now, by understanding the limitations of older techniques and seeing the latest techniques, you can be better prepared to set up a conjoint project that has the best possibility of returning you accurate results that will help your business's bottom line. Here's some other topics that you might find interesting. Most of them can be found in the resources section of my website and some on my blog. Thanks for listening. Feel free to contact me with any questions. And you can keep up on new topics by checking my blog or following me on Twitter. Thanks very much.